Movie's done. Uh, so we're still setting up the stage here, as you can see. Uh, but that was great. Uh, I want to uh, thank you for sticking around. I want to uh, bring producer Christina Fawn and executive producer Stevie Salas up to the stage. Give them a hand. musician and you do an in-store, you have this thing like Spinal Tap where you're scared shitless that you're going to show up and no one's going to be there and you're going to be sitting there like an asshole with your pen and nobody wants your autograph or this is like you go to the film and, and we've gone to some cities around the world where it's been kind of a small crowd and it's like, ah. Oh. So then you still hope at the end that people aren't going to say, you suck. So we're really happy that you guys, I'm glad you guys liked it. Thank you so much. Yes. So, so as I, I alluded to earlier, I loved this movie. Uh, so I just wanted to find out, so Stevie, this movie kind of originated with you, so it kind of came out of your head and your heart. Can you talk a little bit about why you thought this movie needed to be made? Well, originally, I, I left San Diego in 1985, and I, I moved in with a guy who's here tonight, Winston A. Watson Jr., from uh, Tucson's famous drummer, played with Bob Dylan, played with me for years. He's here somewhere with his daughter, who was actually born on our first world tour somewhere. And yeah. Winston had to fly yeah. back. It cost me a fortune and a plane ticket. Um, and she's a grown-up now, and she's here with her new husband. But uh, the, all those years back, we were... Um, I started touring with Rod Stewart in 1988. And just out of curiosity, you know, Winston and I... Winston was Dutch, Indonesian, and African American, and I was a Native American, and and we we, we th to us, I think we all thought we looked like everybody else because we were in Hollywood trying to make it in rock and roll. And as I joined Rod Stewart's band, I realized that we 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 were had a different look. We just didn't look like everybody else. But I always just thought we did, you know. I just assumed because well, we were there to play rock and roll. And so, out of curiosity, I started to look up Native American musicians that were doing what I was doing because I thought to myself, I can't surely I can't be the only one. And, uh, but when we were young, in uh, those years in the 80s, Winston was a huge fan of Randy Castillo from Ozzy Osbourne, who you saw in the film tonight. Because um, the Wombleys would come to Tucson and the Wombleys would come to Phoenix to play. And uh, Randy Castillo was a hero to Winston. And so when, when, when Randy Castillo would come on MTV, we would stop everything and we'd put that fucking TV on and like watch Randy do his, hit his head and do all that shit which Winston ended up doing for years and he was even with Bob Dylan hitting his head which, which is crazy because Bob Dylan's all you know folked up but, but Winston so this all came from Randy Castillo so there's their influence even deeper there right but uh, so this started way back then with some of that and just out of a hobby I started to want to know more about what other Native American musicians there were. And ironically, while I was playing for Rod Stewart, I realized that I was playing guitar parts by Jesse Ed Davis, who 10 years before me was Rod Stewart's guitar player. And um, so it just became like a hobby, really. And then later on, as I became older, I wanted to do something that would, I realized a lot of Native Americans didn't have a lot of role models. So I thought, well, here's a, some amazing role models. And that was just the goal then. Let's get, let Native American people know that they have some heroes here. And so we wanted to make a film about heroes. And uh, as we were making the film and as we created this exhibit at the Smithsonian first, we uncovered all this other history that you saw in the film. And we realized that not only were these guys heroes to the people that we've always called our heroes in rock and roll, Jimmy Page and Jeff Beck and Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton's writing me, telling me about how amazing Jesse Ed Davis is. You know, they used to call Eric Clapton God, right? That's what they used to call Eric Clapton, God. And so I thought, well, Eric Clapton's hiring Jesse Ed Davis to play on his records. Well, what's that make Jesse Ed Davis? <laughs> so that's so that, how this thing happened. And, and we ended up by accident changing written history as we know it. And now Christina, my partner, she makes all the deals with the HBO and everybody. And we're in the middle of a deal now where they're changing school curriculums based on our film now, changing history in schools. Also, um, I've been producing native content for a long time. Uh, Resolution Pictures is based in Montreal. I'm, I'm not native. I'm Jewish, Hungarian. Uh, we, we wanted to 
to make this film, and I think Stevie agrees, like we wanted to, it to be a celebration. A lot of Native content is always or often sad or depressing or political, and I think this film, we, wa we really wanted it to be a celebration where there was a lot of joy and um, yeah. positive, you know, just a positive vibe to it. So I think we, I think we were successful. We wanted to make a hero about movie. You know, we want to make a, a movie about heroes. We don't want it to be, you stole their land, you stole their music, you screwed us again. We just said, no, forget all that, forget all that. Let's just leave, tell you about these amazing guys and women in this film. And that's, that was our goal. And it is, it is political inherently, but it also you rocks. Get it, you get it automatically yeah, exactly. without us having yeah. to shove it down your throat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, uh, Christina, you also produced a great film we were talking about earlier called Real Engine, which we showed here at The Loft. Um, they saw it. Uh, and it's a great bookend to Rumble, I think, because it's about the Native American depiction in Hollywood movies, um, but without big stars. I think that's how you described yeah. it. Yeah. Well, Real Engine, um, I think, was a, um, a film that uh, we did to, you know, just start off the whole discussion about how Native Americans are portrayed in entertainment and movies, and uh, there was a lot of stereotypes, and we wanted to, the way we did it, we, we did it, uh, Real Engine is that we wanted to include humor and uh, to make it funny, and so that way people won't feel bad and it would just be inclusive. And I think that's the main thing that Real Engine did. And then, um, so Rumble came after when I, we met, Stevie and I met, and we decided we're gonna do this film, Rumble, which was you know, five years of very difficult filmmaking. Yeah. And, um, and then, yeah, so I mean, it was both, both films were very, uh, I guess, gratifying in a lot of ways, but they were both difficult to make. And, I think that um, both of them had a lot of entertainment, a lot of humor, and they were both celebrations. The, the thing is, is that I didn't want to make a film. I, I, I remember watching films as a kid where, uh, say, um, you, knew, you knew about the African-American experience and the development of rock and roll with Little Richard and Robert Johnson, and we all heard stories about the, the, the white you know, experience of the development of rock and roll with Elvis and the Beatles and Bill Haley. But we, I wanted to tell the story of the Red Experience that was really, truly a valuable experience. And I didn't want to see, I remember seeing a film once where an African-American um, musicologist said, Elvis was a racist. He stole everything from Little Richard. And I don't know if that was true or not, but it came from a negative spot. And I didn't want that. I wanted to say, you know what, if Steven Tyler was influenced by Jesse Ed Davis, then I'm just going to have Steven Tyler tell you. So that way you can say, well, if I told you, go like, eh. But if Steven Tyler tells you, if Eric Clapton tells you, you're going to be like, well, I should maybe think about this seriously. And that's why. And it was because of that, uh, you know, dancing around star schedules. It took five years to make a film because, like, Steven Tyler would call and say, meet me in L.A. tomorrow. So you go to L.A. tomorrow, and then you go, I can't do it today. And then um, tomorrow at 4 o'clock, I can't do it at 4 o'clock. And then finally on Thursday, I'd be like, I'd been there all week, and he'd be like, sorry, I can't do it. I'm playing Hollywood Bowl tonight. It's bad, Stevie. So then luckily I knew him enough. And I knew a lot of these guys enough from working with them since I was a kid, all these superstar guys that I get to work with. And I, I could say, fuck you. It's like, I'm here all week, you know? I mean, we don't have a lot of money. It's a documentary. And he's like, God damn it, okay, come, can you be here in five minutes? And I say, yes. So it take, you know, I'd be at the beach in Santa Monica and he's at the Sunset Marquee. It takes me 45 minutes to get there, but I'll be there in five minutes. So I get there, he'd be an hour late. And he goes, you got five minutes. And then he would talk for two hours. So that's what it was like. And in a, in a roundabout way, Jimi Hendrix was very instrumental in getting this film made. Is that right? Christina, Christina, I was living in Canada for a year, and Christina and Catherine, the director, invited me to a thing called Hot Docs, which ironically, five years later, our film won Hot Docs. And, um, and they had me stand, and, it was very cool, actually, because they gave us $50,000 when we won. It was amazing. Well, we won uh, for Best Canadian Film, or the Audience Award for um, Best Canadian Film, and then we won for the Overall Audience Award at Hot Dogs, so yeah, that was pretty cool. amazing. It was pretty cool, because it's the biggest documentary, one of the biggest documentary festivals in the, in the world. But they had me sit down in front of every network, you know, AMC, the, the, the History Channel, all of them, and they just had me sit, one, boom, 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 boom. And every network said yes when we pitched Rumble. Every network said yes. So then Christina had the task of trying to figure out, okay, if PBS does it here and it crosses the borders, all the stuff that, uh, a producer like Christina has to deal with. And um, 
So PBS was our, we never thought we'd be in the theaters. We just thought we were going to make this really cool film and it would be on PBS, on Independent Lens or something really credible and cool. And that was good enough for us, I thought, right? So the guy from PBS was an African-American man who ran PBS. And he called up, I think he called Christina, and he says, Jimi Hendrix, are you guys kidding me? He's like, you're going to, that's kind of a stretch. Because, you know, we've all known, we've all grew up as Jimi Hendrix is an African-American superhero, really, right? And, but when I did the exhibit at the Smithsonian years before we did the movie, Janie Hendrix, his sister, called me and said, Jimmy has to be in this exhibit. You know, our grandmother's Cherokee, and it's super important to us, and it was super important to Jimmy, and she explained all the reasons why. So I jumped on a plane, and I flew to Washington, D.C., and had a meeting with the man from PBS, and I secretly arranged for Janie Hendrix to call my cell phone while I was in front of his desk. <laughs> I'm not kidding. And Janie Hendrix lit him up so hard, and he agreed then to do the film, and that's where we were able to... Let's get started on the making of the film. There's so many great artists in this film. I'm just curious if any, were there any stories that surprised you? Any, any artists that you just didn't know about? Well, when I was a kid in uh, Winston, I keep talking to Winston because he's a Tucson hero and he's here tonight, but Winston and I were in LA in the 80, late 80s, trying to make it as rock, rock and roll guys. And we, we were out with a guy called Ivan Neville, who was in the film tonight, and from the, his, you know, for the Neville brothers, he's the son of Aaron Neville, and, and he's an amazing musician, and played with Keith Richards, and all of us guys were all hanging around back then. We were all around. It was just, you know, we were all just young guys. And Ivan used to talk about the Mardi Gras Indians, because he's from New Orleans, and, and we didn't really know what the Mardi Gras Indians were, and Ivan didn't really know what they were. And it wasn't until Cyril Neville used to scare the shit out of me, because we were both managed by Bill Graham, and so I would show up to things with, with uh, the Neville brothers, and Cyril was really militant. And I was just young, and I was just more cared about, you know, trying to buy a Porsche or trying to get laid. And he was really like a badass, and he used to scare the shit out of me. And uh, so when we filmed him for Rumble, he was like the guy who really schooled us about what was going on with Native American mixed blood with African Americans and what was going on and why it was outlawed and why the Mardi Gras Indians, those were the only days that, that they could celebrate their Native blood without getting in trouble for it. Now, most people just thought they were dressing up like it was Halloween. That's what most people think still, probably to this day. But for them, it was a whole other thing. It was their secret day to celebrate their Native American heritage. And I never knew that. And that blew my mind when, when they told me that. So. And so one scene in this movie that really just really struck me was the Red Bone sequence, where they're on, is it the Midnight Special yeah. TV show? Yeah. So is it, was that, that was 74, when they were doing Come and Get Your Love. Yeah. And they were in full Native American garb doing a ceremonial yeah. dance and then launching into this like really top 40 pop song. What was it about that era that allowed that to happen? You know, they just, th that was their shtick, though. They were a pop band. And, and they were trying to find all the, you saw in the film, they were looking for sticks, right? They were constantly like, what are we going to do? Should we dress like we're white? Should we, what, what are we going to do? And Hendrix said, you guys are Indians. Do the Indian thing. And that was a true story. And so they did that. But really... What David Frick from Rolling Stone said that was so important was, at the end of the day, they had amazing songs. Come and Get Your Love is an amazingly written song. And at the end of the day, all the gimmicks in the world won't work. You've got to be great, and you've got to write a great song. And they were writing great songs. But their look was, they couldn't have made it with just a look. So, but that was their thing. So. And so, just from a hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh. And Bert Sugarman, by the way. <laughs> all you guys know Bert Sugarman? You know Midnight Special, a lot of you guys? Well, Bert Sugarman, he's, um, he calls her his, Christina his Jewish daughter he never had. So we, we have lunch with Bert Sugarman and Mary Hart, his wife, and, and he's like uh, hosting our, our Academy screening in L.A. next week, so it's pretty cool. So just, I don't know if people know or if there's Academy voters here, but so uh, Rumble is now officially uh, eligible for Oscar. So... We're part of the uh, 170 eligible feature documentary uh, Oscar nominees, and we're, we're in the middle of a huge campaign, and we're trying to get on the 15 shortlist. 
So we're really excited about that. And we're having screening in San Francisco and in LA and in New York. And we have a bunch of ads and variety in LA Times and the, the Hollywood Reporter. And we're just, so we're really excited and we're working hard to make that happen. Yeah. Just try. I, I wish. I don't know, just do it, try. Yeah, there's 300 and, I think there's 350 doc voters who can vote to get us onto the shortlist. Surely there's a good tech guy here, right? If the Russians can hack the president election, someone here can hack the friggin', the friggin' academy one, right? Jesus. We'll make it happen. We will make that happen. No, this is one of the best docs of the year, for sure. So if there's justice, you'll be shortlisted for sure. Yeah. Thank you. And I just wanted to preemptively ask this question because I know people will ask me for weeks after seeing this film, is there going to be a companion soundtrack? Well, as you can imagine, you know, the whole idea of this film was these are the most important songs that we all grew up with. So, you know, you want to, you want to, you know how much it costs to pay for the publishing for Elton John and John Lennon singing, you know, uh, whatever gets you through the night? Those are the two most iconic musicians in the history of rock and roll, and their song isn't cheap. So if we get an, I think that if we get an Academy nomination, um, I think then Sony or somebody will then say it's a safer bet to release a, 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 an album along with the film. But, you know, all those guys care about is getting paid, right? And those songs are not cheap. It's not like you, you know, these are the most, exp you know, doctor my eyes. It's like, come on. It's like we all know these songs. These are standards, and they're expensive. So let's hope that we get nominated for Academy Award. And then I bet there will be a soundtrack album to go with it. And just before we open it up to audience questions, I just wanted to put the bid in for the director's cut. Because I know that before you got into Sundance, this film was really long super long like I think it was about we were we were about three hours in um, basically we we have a, a international distributor who was um, very good friends with the Sundance programmer and uh, it was November or no maybe it was September and uh, you know he said okay let's let's submit the film so what we did it was, it was just a crazy time we had to fire our initial direct uh, editor we got a new editor we got a story consultant we put the chapters together. We had no ending. We were in fighting about a, a whole we're, bunch. We were barely <laughs> talking. Yeah, we were barely talking. <laughs> we were, and but we're still friends, and we're now we're just you know. So it all came together. We ended up submitting it without the ending. Um, come November, we find out we're we're in. We're like, oh shit. Now we're, we're, we have to get this together. And everybody was planning, they were all, you know, they're Canadians. They go on vacations for months at a time. So it's like, because they got, you know, they, they got a good life up there. And so they were already all, the, all everyone's Christmas vacation got screwed. It was like, yeah. it's like, because no, we, we were working through the holidays. We got an extension into January, like 12th or something. Yeah, like that. something like that. We were supposed to give it in on the 4th. So we ended up just, you know, putting it together. We had, um, a, a beautiful native woman who was uh, an animator. So all the, the the animation components that went along with each of the icons, we worked on that before the holidays with our co-director who did the cinematography. And they came up with this beautiful concept of, you know, creating these childhood images in animation, uh, you know, to go with all the icons. And uh, it was just, a, it was a hard time. But I think everyone put, you know, put their 100% in and we, we ended up creating something that I think is quite beautiful. So we're pretty proud of it. Did you lose anything that just kills you? I lost editing? one thing. Um, Mildred Bailey, her brother was best friends with this uh, unknown guy called Bing Crosby. <laughs> okay, so, Bing Cro so Mildred Bailey has her own radio show and she hires this guy, Bing Crosby. His first job for years was her singer on her radio show. And Bing Crosby went on to become the highest, the biggest selling recording artist in the history of music up until probably, you know, the Beatles maybe. You know, I, I don't know, maybe in the 40s, he was selling 40, 50 million albums, something crazy like that. And we just somehow never got Bing in there. You know, we had Tony Bennett and he was so amazing and, and we just couldn't fit it all in. And there's another little piece, like little gem that we didn't get in was um, the John Lennon uh, tape. Oh yeah, that so he, he, yeah, that was, that was John Lennon. John Lennon and Jesse Ed Davis were really great friends, and we believe that the reason that Jesse Ed went back to using was um, after John died. He went into a depression because John had called his phone and left him a message the day he actually got shot, 
And Jesse didn't listen to his answering machine. His wife had the message still until four days after the fact. And our theory was, and his wife's theory was, this is what happened and he went into a depression. Um, and we actually have the, we have John Lennon, like, up yours, where are you at? Yeah, they all had nicknames for each other and it's John Lennon. And, and we didn't get it in the film. We, we couldn't quite figure out how to do it with the right amount of taste and the right to make it really make sense. But we have all these things and maybe one day we're gonna do like a eight or 10 part series in depth because each one of these guys that you see in the film, you see, you know, you see Johnny, not Johnny Ramon, you see uh, Marky Ramon Marky. talking, you know, two lines. Well, we got an hour of him. We got an hour of every one of these guys. So one day we want to do an in-depth version of this in a mini-series type of a thing. And then may all those things are getting. Are you ever going to write a book? You have stories for years. I got a, bu I got a book out already. It's a, it came out like four years ago, yeah. Go on Amazon. It's a, oh, go to Amazon. It sells really good, too. <laughs> it, when, and Winston's in it. Where are you, Winston? It's your night. Yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a story about when I was a kid, and I got this gig with Rod Stewart, and I didn't know what I was doing, and I almost got fired every week, but because there was no time to fire me and replace me, I never got, lost my job, and somehow I made it through the year, and, and Winston and I got signed Island Records, and it was, but it's what the book's about, so, and it's full of those kind of stories, because really, it's called When We Were the Boys, and it's about, I mean, Carmine Rojas was Rod Stewart's bass player, was David Bowie's bass player, and I was a David Bowie fanatic, and Carmine's poster was on my mom's wall, and now I'm, some, I'm in a band with the guy. And, you know, it's, it's a story about being young and being stupid, but being, figuring out how to get through it. And, and then I talked about, through years later, all the things I learned from Rod, you know, playing with Jagger, playing with, you know, music directing at American Idol, or any of these things that I learned. Everything I learned in that foundation was there, and that's what the book sort of talks to you about, sort of this being a kid and figuring all these things out. And, um, and, it's, and it's kind of a funny book because I make fun of myself a lot, and it, which, which I should have because I was an idiot. <laughs> but the, the funny thing is that when we went to Sundance, Stevie had already booked a, a tour in Japan, a very big tour where he had, had to make some money because there's no money to be made on documentary films. So he wasn't able to be at Sundance, but we beamed him in. But we didn't Japan. think we were going to get in Sundance, so I didn't give a shit, right? And then I, and I'm like, oh my God, we're actually going to be in, and I can't be there after working on this friggin' film for five years. And so they're there partying, and I got some of my Native American friends that are rich to put on this huge party and Taboo from the Black Eyed Peas DJed, and they're partying their ass off, having a great time, and I'm stuck rehearsing in Japan. I was so pissed off. <laughs> And they won, so they were all celebrating. It was like amazing. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions for Stevie and Christina? How about right here? I always loved uh, Contact from the under, Underworld with, uh, with Red Robbie. Uh, the, the, did you talk to Robertson about that? I mean, yeah, to me, you know, when you were talking about Redbone doing that uh, on stage where they would have the people in the digits, uh costume <laughs> and then rock go into into this wonderful rock. Yeah. But that was this amazing combination of really extraordinary native music with really beautiful kind of folk. Well, I'll tell you something about that. Because that's Robbie Robertson, obviously, right? Yeah. Robbie says the, the classic line in the film that really sets the tone for human beings during this era, which is his mother said, you know, be proud of who you are, but be careful who you tell that you're Native American. Robbie didn't feel safe or even to, for Robbie to come out and become, when we, I, I, I didn't even know he was a Mohawk. And I work on Six Nations, and he's from Six Nations. He did not let it be known, like many people always say to us around the world, how did we not know these stories? Because nobody wanted to be a Native American when my grandparents were coming up in Clifton, Arizona, in the Apache land there. And nobody wanted to be there because only bad things were happening to Native American people. And so Robbie, in 1987, or to do this, Maybe it was 98, uh, in the 90s, I meant, I meant 97, 98, yeah, I'm sorry, not 87, 88. And Rob, so for Robbie to do that, it took him a long time to decide, I am going to celebrate this part of my heritage. And then, and then as he says in the end, well, you wouldn't let me talk about it before, but now I'm going to talk real loud. And that's what he was talking about. That's what he was talking about. Yeah, you know, Robbie's, a, and he's Robbie Robertson, he's a legend, he's, he's amazing. Yeah, so. uh, there was a question back here. Yes. I felt like I learned so much about Native music, but it was also 
music that I grew up with, that song, I saw that Midnight Special when I was 12. It was awesome. But you gave us such a gift because this is music that we can all celebrate. I picked up a drum set a couple of weeks ago and it was the best feeling. I was like, I need to have one of these right now. And like watching that tonight, I was like, yes, I do need to have those drums. And so my point is that there's, it, it erased divisiveness. You gave natives their voice in music and the respect and we all can respect but we also are allowed access to that music and that is a wonderful gift and that's what we need right now and this film is really important so i just want to say thank you it was beautiful and awesome yeah. native americans have a place at the table now we never knew we, they never knew we never knew we had and, it, and we have a place at the table now in, in history so it's great for in the, you know really what the story is really about is the development of north america the repressed people the africans and the African slaves that were coming over and the Native American people were being shipped away and the Native American women and the children that were being born with the Irish and the Scottish and repressed and, and, and the, the music blending and the, these things. And it really, it's the flavor of what became North America. Really, if you really think about it, music was a byproduct of the flavor of all these things from these incredible cultures that were coming together. And a lot of people took credit for this and this and this and this. But really, it was a big blend of, of everybody. And, and that's what the movie sort of really says in the end, I think. Yeah, you, you've really exposed the real history of America. That's what it really I the mean, movie. That's, that's the real amazing. story of the movie. Yeah. The music was a was the was the thing we used. Yeah. But it really is the story of of America and the development of America and how these cultures, in their in their uniqueness, created one big unique amazing thing. Yep. It's pretty amazing. How about this person? I just want to ask how many of the featured artists are in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame or have made their way well, they, into that's a good question. the jazz because, hall? Because um, yeah, Link Ray, who's, you know, to me, he's the inventor of... Link Ray came in in 1957-58 and does rumble and creates distorted guitar, which influences Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck, Pete Townsend, Dave Davies, you know, the guys that we all listen to that we call the Mount Rushmore of rock and roll, okay? And then you have... He's not in the Hall of Fame, but we got him nominated this year. And people can vote, but it's got the voters. I was with Slash the other night, and I'm not trying to name drop, but he's a pal of mine. And I was with him in Toronto the other night, and he says, I voted for Link this year. So he's, people are talking now. The film's bringing up the discussion of why on earth isn't Link Ray when every, you know, Jimmy Page, Jeff Beck told me one time that he and Jimmy Page were 17 years old at his mom's house, and they used to jump around on his bed playing air guitar to Link Ray. It's like, that's crazy. Right? It's like Jeff Beck and Jimmy Page. So, and the other thing that was also crazy, you know, is that this guy invented distorted guitar, and he's not in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Jesse Ed Davis played with all four Beatles. All four Beatles played with Clapton, played with Rod Stewart, played with the Stones. And you don't know his name? Anybody else you'd know who the fuck that was, right? So there's a little something going on there, and we're changing it. And the people are changing it, so it's all good. And the great thing is that all the artists, the artists that we love, they're the ones that are really changing it, because they're the ones that are standing up and saying, yeah. But so we, there's some, some artists that are in the film that are in the... Only, only Robbie Robertson. Oh, Elliot Easton. No, 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 no. So next week in L.A., if you guys want to come out, we're doing a screening, and Elliot Easton from The Cars is this year on the ballot, and he's speaking with us. Wayne Kramer from the MC5 is on the ballot, and he's speaking with us. And... Uh, they're, but they're not Native American, but the only person I believe in our film that's in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame is Robbie Robertson. Oh, and Jimi Hendrix. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, I, just wanted to, I just wanted to ask about the final scene, the, the Standing Rock footage. So that's such a great way to end the film. Um, when did you decide to do that? Like, what was your kind of purpose with that? We, we were fighting about the end of the film. We, we, you weren't fighting with me. She was my only ally, really. The director, the director is incredibly creative, Catherine Bainbridge. And her daughters had went to see a local Canadian band that were kind of a hip-hop band, and they got a good buzz in Canada. And she goes, we should do this because it shows that the future... And I go, bullshit. That's not big enough. It was it's not the big Tribe enough. Called Red. Yeah, but I'm not trying to put Tribe Called Red down. I mean, they're friends of mine. But it was not right for this film to end on that. Um, ironically, a f many years ago... Taboo from the Black Eyed Peas had contacted me. Um, and, you know, he'd sold 60 million records. And he's like, you know, my, my mother is a Shoshone and my, my, my grandmother's Shoshone and I, need, I want to learn more. So I did 
for Taboo what Randy Castillo had done for me. And I brought him out to Indian Country, and I started taking him around. And Taboo, ironically, without me knowing it, went to Standing Rock and did that whole thing. And that ending scene that's in our film was shot a long time ago, but it did, this year it won the Video Music Award at the MTV Awards uh, for that song, and Taboo won an MTV Award for that particular piece, which is the end of our film. And Taboo took it upon himself. He's got a lot of influence, obviously, with the younger people, because I'm, you know, I'm old as dirt now. So nobody, I, I talk to young people, they don't even know who Rod Stewart is. So <laughs> Taboo is, is, has a lot of influence, and so he, gra he grabbed all those kids up there, Standing Rock, and he created this music, and, and it's been a great thing because he's, he's, he's opening eyes to young people. But I, I think also, like, he, like Stevie was saying, we, we were having a lot of trouble with the ending just because of that of trying to keep it as a global success story and, and a global uh, purpose in, in, in the film and what, what was going on at the time. And Standing Rock was going on at the time. And so, you know, as he was... And it was a protest. It was a, yeah, it was a protest, and we, but we included it as another celebration. And then, you know, again, with um, the, the difficulties of creative people, you know, just working together and figuring out what the right thing was. And, uh, you know, so Catherine and I had long, long, long hours discussions about what we should do. And, and then uh, we had our co-director, who was also the DOP, working with an editor and then finding that beautiful video clip and footage of Standing Rock. And then we just thought, okay, that's, that's just a, a, such a per perfect ending to the film where it, it made us all feel very empowered. And it tied into, tied into history, it tied into Wounded Knee, it tied into all the things that Native American people were no known for being on the front line, and it showed that they're still on the front line. Yeah. So that's what, it really made a lot of sense, and how we didn't see that so easily, but now, it, like, um, we're geniuses now, so. <laughs> It was a killer ending, and that was the right way to end it. Uh, also, just so you know, uh, on Wednesday night, we're showing Awake, A Dream from uh, Standing Rock, which is a great new documentary. Myron Dewey, the director, is going to be here. Um, so please come to that. That's Wednesday night at 7.30. Um, so we're kind of getting ready to wrap up. Does, are there any more questions for Steve? Okay. Um, first of all, to answer the question you first put, there is a Spotify playlist that which I No, yeah, we, we did that deal, yeah. And it was little Steven, actually. Steve, Steven created that, and he, he gave it to me in New York. Hey, Stevie, baby. He calls me Stevie, baby. Um, Stevie, baby. It's like him. No, no, yeah, he does it. He calls me Stevie, baby, even in emails. Stevie, baby. It's Stevie, baby. I swear to God. If you see him like on Sopranos, that's really what he talks like. And uh, he, um, he made that. I gave this. He goes, wow, I made this. And he handed me the two discs. We were at the film forum in New York City for a theatrical opening. He showed up to speak with me. And uh, he gave me those CDs. And I go, God, I can't believe you did that. It, He's a busy guy. He goes, well, I didn't actually do it. I just made a list of the songs and told the guy who works for me to do it. So, but that is his list. And so when it came up and people were talking about a list, I said, just use Stevie Van Zandt's list because it's amazing. And he's a genius. I mean, I love Stevie Van Zandt. So, so I was also going to say, I was surprised not to see Tribe Called Red in this because they're awesome. Yeah. And also just that the music really touched my spirit and the, the whole film is amazing. See, so it wasn't a film about native music. It was a film about these musicians that against all odds influenced everything that we know. So that's why Tribe Called Red or Derek Miller's, Derek's in the film as an actor, but, or, you know, it, it wasn't about, it was about the influence that these guys had on all the music that we listen to today. And that was the story. And that's why the ending with Tribe Called Red wasn't working because although they're amazing and they're super talented, this was about influence. This was about, if you listen to John Lennon and he's influenced by a Native American musician, and people need to know that, right? So. There's a question over here. Yes, please. Yeah, um, I was uh, very moved by the group of um, women vocalists. I was very moved by the group of women vocalists. I think it was a quartet, and it was just beautiful, moving, but also just something I had, uh, a sound I had never heard before. It was just stunning. If you, you got to go buy their records now. If you could just <laughs> talk a little bit more about that group. And well, also, sorry, about Link Ray, the obviously hugely uh, influential riff, you can't overstate it, but then uh, recently I discovered he also did some uh, sort of sing song or uh, Americana Roots albums maybe 10 or 12 years later that also uh, are now getting uh, recognition. So could you talk about the sort of other Link Ray work? Link, Link Ray is an interesting story because he was like this guy that wouldn't go away. 
if you really think about it. Okay, so in 1957, 58, he creates the distorted guitar, and he he gets you know banned for for inciting riots, even though there's not one lyric on the song. Okay, and he's such a great Indian. I mean, that's a great Indian story, and. <laughs> So then he kind of goes away for a while. He influences Townsend and everybody, and they go on to become huge. Jimmy Page becomes huge. Uh, the Yardbirds, everybody becomes huge. And you, don't, you, you forget about Link Ray. And then all of a sudden, punk rock starts in 1978. There's Link Ray with Robert Gordon in New York City with Steve, Steve Jones and everybody's, everybody. They're going back to that. It's almost like punk rock, if you really think about it, a lot of it had, a, had 50s sensibilities to it. Eddie Cochran, these kind of guys were heroes to punk rockers. And Link Ray's right there touring with Robert Gordon and he's in the thick of it, and probably in his 40s already by this point. Okay, so he's there at the birth of punk rock now. So he's at the birth of music and rock and roll. Now he's at the birth of punk rock. And then he disappears again, kind of gets lost in the shuffle again for a lot of years. Makes some cool records that people don't know about, don't hear, no relevance because people are you know, off on other things. And then Robert Rodriguez, the great filmmaker from where I live in Austin, Texas, starts getting some power, and he puts, he puts Link Ray in scripts. Uh, this one guy says, I think I'm Road, road Racer. Was that Road Racer? Where Arquette, what's his name? Uh, uh, David, Arquette. David Arquette says, when I, I want to be like Link Ray. And the girl's like, who's Link Ray? And he goes, he's the coolest. <laughs> you know, so like, and people, you know, that was pretty bold of Robert to do that. And Robert told me, from his lips to my ears, that he told, told Tarantino, you got to put Link Ray in Pulp Fiction. And so Pulp Fiction explodes, you hear Rumble again, and he's back in the game. And so now all of a sudden he's part of like Johnny Depp with, oh, I want to be Link Ray. You know, and Johnny Depp told me that. So all of a sudden he's in Blow. He's in every soundtrack. He becomes a sound that identifies cool. That's why all the filmmakers want to be hip and cool, and they use Link Ray in their soundtracks. Because it, it's like Charlie the Tuna shows good taste, right? It's like, but it's like, it's like that. And so Link Ray becomes relevant again in the soundtracks of all the coolest movies coming out. And you, know, and you see Scorsese right there. He's all about it, right? So Link Ray has this weird thing where he just wouldn't go away. And that just shows you the true greatness. That's true greatness. Because you can try to squish it, but it always finds a way back up, right? There you go. It's the Charlie the Tuna philosophy. Yeah. I never, I never thought. You know, a lot of guys, if Johnny Depp does it, then hey, we should use Link Ray too. Who is he? I don't give a fuck. Just put him in the sound tag. People will think it's cool. Okay, so last question. How about right here? It wasn't a gratuitous thing. I mean, they earned it. I, I know that, but that doesn't mean they're always represented. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you something right now, okay? I, I made a film with a production company called Resolution Pictures, and it's all chicks. <laughs> and they're Canadian chicks, so they're even more hammering me constantly. And they're pretty like, oh, and Buffy, Buffy's everyone's hero. Buffy, is, Buffy St. Marie is, you know, she's probably got 50 or 60 songs that have been recorded as a songwriter from everyone from Elvis Presley, Glenn Campbell, to Courtney Love. And people don't even talk about that. She's an incredible songwriter. You know, she... So you, these people earn these things, and they are who they are. We didn't discriminate. We didn't try to say, let's try to get a balance. We just, there was just only a few. That's so how, that shows you how beaten down things were, you know? So now because of these 13 or 12 or whatever it was, there's going to be 24, and there's going to be 48, and there's going to be more and more and more, we hope, because we hope the film inspires everyone to understand that anything is possible, and if these guys did it in the worst of times, then anything is indeed possible. I want to give a huge thanks to Stevie Salas and Christina Fawn for being here. You've not only given us a great film, but you, I think, made a really important contribution to American history. That's great. So, hey. Thank you very much. We're super happy to be here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And Rumble's showing later in the week. Come see it again. <laughs>